Hello guys, it's Elizabeth and welcome back to my channel. I'm going to be filming another true crime video today and again, it's a solved case. So for today's solved case, we're going to be talking about the murder of Joanna Yates. Joanna Yates was born on the 19th of April, 1985. She was born in a place called Hampshire in England, which is kind of like Southern England. She attended a private school growing up and she later went on to get her undergraduate degree in landscape architecture. Not long after that, going on to complete a PhD from the University of Gloucester, also in landscape architecture. And in December of 2008, Joanna met, and in December of 2008, Joanna met another architect named Greg Reardon. And he was from a town called Winchester, which is also in Hampshire, where Joanna grew up. So they started dating, and in 2009, they decided that they were ready for the next step in their relationship. And so they decided to move in together. So the architecture firm that they were both working at actually ended up relocating to a town called Bristol so they decided again it was the right time so they would move to Bristol together and in October of 2010 they moved into a flat together in a suburb of Bristol and this flat was actually in like an old converted house so it was a big house that had been converted into a number of other smaller apartments. By December 2010 the couple had been in their apartment together for a few months and they were very happy together and Greg actually planned to go away for a weekend to Sheffield so Joanna would be alone for the weekend in the apartment but when Greg returned at around 8 p.m on Sunday the 19th of December he found that Joanna was not at the apartment and so at first he called and texted her just to see if she'd popped out somewhere or where she might be and actually after a few times calling her he noticed that her phone was ringing in her coat pocket which was hanging up in the apartment. Upon further inspection he found that her purse and her keys were also still in the flat as well as noticing that the cat had been neglected so I assume that this just means that the cat hadn't been fed and the litter box hadn't been changed just like small signs that would suggest that someone hadn't been there for a couple of days so at around half past midnight that night Greg actually called the police to report Joanna missing as well as notifying Joanna's parents that he couldn't find her. During the initial investigation of course police began to determine Joanna's last movements they realized that on the 17th of December on the Friday night she had actually been out to a local pub with some friends and work colleagues. This pub was called the Bristol Ram and was about a 30 minute walk away from Joanna's apartment. Her colleagues said that that night Joanna seemed like she was in pretty good spirits, completely normal, although she did voice that she was a little bit apprehensive about spending the weekend in the apartment by herself. It would be her first weekend in their flat without Greg and she was a little bit nervous about this, but she had made some plans to occupy herself for the weekend. Greg and Joanna were actually planning on hosting a party the following week so she planned on baking and doing some preparation for that party. She also planned to do some more Christmas shopping so she really did have a few things that she kind of expected to do that weekend that would keep her occupied whilst her boyfriend was away. So Joanne left the pub at around 8 p.m and as I said it was a 30 minute walk home so she began embarking on this walk. At around 8 10 p.m Joanna was seen leaving a local Waitrose supermarket although she left empty-handed she hadn't bought anything. Joanna also phoned her best friend at around 8.30pm and they organised to meet up on Christmas Eve. And then at 8.40pm, Joanna was seen on CCTV at a local Tesco supermarket picking up a pizza. As well as this, Joanna bought two small bottles of cider from a local convenience store. And it's thought that Joanna arrived back to her flat at around 8.45pm. Both Greg and Joanna's parents launched a police campaign and a social media campaign to try and find her in the days after her disappearance. On December 21st, Joanna's parents alongside Greg made a public appeal for Joanna's safe return turn home. Joanna's parents made another public appeal at police press conference on December 23rd 2010 again appealing for her safe return but Joanna's father also stated that he believed Joanna must have been abducted because he did not believe that she would ever leave her apartment without the items that she had left behind including her mobile phone, her keys and her purse. As I said Joanna did buy a pizza on her way home from the pub although police could actually find no signs of this pizza or any signs that it had been consumed they couldn't 
didn't find any packaging. Although they did find the two bottles of cider inside the flat and one of them had actually been partially consumed. Joanna's flat also showed no signs of forced entry or a real struggle and so police began to build on the theory that Joanna must have known the person that had taken her. On the morning of December 25th, 2010, Christmas morning, a couple walking on a nearby lane around 4.8 kilometres from Joanna's flat came across a fully clothed body lying in the snow. This body was identified as that of Joanna Yates and Joanna's father actually came forward and said that he felt somewhat relieved at the finding of her body and of course it was a horrible outcome but police had already told the family to prepare for the worst. I guess now they just felt like they had Joanna home again. Upon the discovery of Joanna's body, police actually launched an appeal for anyone that had any information regarding Joanna's death. As well as this, there were a lot of similarities and comparisons made between a couple of other missing persons and murder cases, including the unsolved murder of 25-year-old Melanie Hall, who disappeared in 1996 and whose body was found 13 years later. As well as this, comparisons were made to the disappearance of Claudia Lawrence, who went missing in 2009 and to this day is still missing. Police generally said that of particular interest, it was the similarities to that of the disappearance and murder of Melanie Hall, generally just because of the similarities of the circumstances of their disappearance. So they were both returning from a meeting with friends, Although this was not actually seen as a credible comparison and in the end police said that they were not really investigating this as a line of possibility anymore. Police also analysed CCTV footage to see if there had been anyone taking the same route as Joanna or anyone that looked like they may have been following her or tracking her home to her apartment. Although there were a couple of issues with this including the fact that the CCTV footage from Joanna's route home was extremely blurry and they couldn't identify anyone nor could they even identify number plates from cars. Additionally to this, there was also another route home that an attacker could have taken to get to Joanna's apartment that would have completely avoided any CCTV and police were aware of this. Due to the frozen conditions of Joanna's body, as I said, she was found lying in the snow. The autopsy results were actually delayed by two days and they came out on the 28th of December and it was determined that Joanna had died from strangulation. Initially, they were toying with the idea that Joanna had possibly been placed there still alive and had frozen to death due to the fact that she actually had no visible signs of injury although as I said this was later ruled out. Police were also able to determine that Joanna had not eaten the pizza that she had purchased as well as this there were no signs of sexual assault. Of course police did initially look into Greg, Joanna's boyfriend. This was kind of just a routine investigation and they didn't really have any evidence but they checked his phone and his laptop just so that they could rule him out as of course he was the person that was closest to Joanna. A young woman came forward that had been attending a party opposite Joanna's flat on the night of the 17th of December and she said that around 9pm she heard what sounded like a scream coming from the direction of Joanna's flat. Another neighbour that lived behind Joanna's home also said he heard what sounded like a scream, although he could not be sure what time this was, but he did say it heard like a woman shouting, help me. So police launched Operation Braid, and this consisted of 80 detectives and civilians under the direction of Chief Inspector Phil Jones. And they really urged for people to come forward, especially those that had been in the local area to where Joanna's body had been found. Police wanted to make it clear that they were doing everything in their power to bring Joanna's killer to justice, including that they had actually examined over 100 hours of CCTV footage, as well as having examined over 293,000 kilograms of rubbish collected from the local area around Joanna's flat. Police also released the information that Joanna had been found with a sock missing and that this sock could not be located at the crime scene nor at Joanna's apartment. DNA had actually been found on Joanna's body and this was tested to see if it matched anyone in the local area that was on the system already. As well as this, police were also tracking a number of sex offenders that lived near Joanna to see if they could determine their movements on the night she disappeared. On December 30th, 2010, Joanna's landlord, Christopher Jeffries, who was also living in the same building as Joanna, was arrested on suspicion of murder. He was taken into police custody so that police could conduct a thorough examination of his flat. And on the 31st of December, police actually were granted a 12-hour extension on the amount of time that they could keep Christopher in custody to question him. Police were able to detain Christopher for up to 96 hours, although after two days he was released on bail. 
after which he appointed himself a lawyer. In the days following Christopher's arrest, a media commentator named Roy Greenslade expressed concern over a number of negative media articles that have been released about Christopher. He actually described this as what he would say is character assassination on a large scale. So I'm going to tell you some of the articles and uh, news covers that were released about Christopher Jeffries after he was arrested on suspicion of murder. Just keep in mind that he had not been charged with anything up until this point. So a Daily Mirror news article included the front page title, Joe's suspect is a peeping Tom. Another article by The Sun read on the front page, The Strange Mr. Jeffries, as well as another article that stated, Joe landlord a creep who freaked out schoolgirls. By March 4th, 2011, Christopher Jeffries was released from bail and police said that he was no longer a suspect. And on the 21st of April, Christopher Jeffries actually launched legal action against six British newspapers seeking damages for libel. And it was pursued that due to Jeffries living alone, he was a retired school teacher and he had quite a unique appearance. He had quite bushy white hair and he just looked somewhat out of the ordinary that newspapers kind of latched onto this idea that because of his physical appearance that he had to be guilty. Christopher actually won an undisclosed sum of money in this case seeking libel damages as well as receiving an apology from investigators for the damages that were caused after his arrest. And this is because they actually did not have any evidence linking Christopher to Joanna's murder. They didn't have any sufficient evidence. They only had the fact that he was her landlord and a tip that they had received, which I will get further into later along in the video. In January 2011, the British TV show Crime Watch actually organised for a reconstruction of Joanna's disappearance to be filmed. And they actually hired a quite specialised and professional team of filmmakers to do this for them, to be able to recreate the snowy conditions that there were on the night of Joanna's disappearance. The same TV show, Crime Watch, actually released an appeal from Joanna's parents, calling for anyone that had information regarding her disappearance and murder to come forward. And they actually determined that they believe Joanna's body might have been transported using a a suitcase or a hold all. And on January 20th, 32 year old Vincent Tabat, an architectural engineer who lived with his girlfriend next door to Joanna, was arrested on suspicion of murder. So Vincent Tabak was born on the 10th of February 1978 in the Netherlands and he moved to the UK for work in 2007. As I said, he was also an architectural engineer. Vincent was described as an intelligent, introverted loner and he he was also highly educated. He had a master's degree as well as a PhD which he completed in 2007 which led to his thesis later being published in 2008. So Vincent moved to Bath in 2007 for a new job and this is where he established a relationship with a woman that he had met through an online dating website called Soulmates and this woman was Vincent's first serious girlfriend and in June of 2009 they moved to Bristol and they actually moved into the same building as Joanna and her boyfriend, although a year earlier than Joanna and Greg. So they moved in in June 2009 and Joanna and Greg didn't move in until October 2010. Joanna and Vincent had been described as basically being strangers. As I said, Joanna had only moved into that building in October of 2010 and Vincent actually embarked on a business trip to California on November 6th, 2010, not returning until December 11th. So there were only about a couple of weeks period that they were actually living under the same roof of that building. And so they were pretty much strangers. Police did not initially release any information as to why Christopher was being detained. And this was mostly because of the backlash that was faced against Christopher Jeffries. And they wanted to avoid the same negative media coverage that he had experienced, especially if they had gotten it wrong again. But it came out that Vincent was actually arrested after an anonymous tip was received after the airing of the appeal by Joanna's parents on the TV show Crime Watch. So Vincent was actually initially ruled out as a suspect in the early days 
phase of the investigation into Joanna's disappearance and subsequent murder. And on the 23rd of December, Vincent's apartment was actually searched and he made a joke that they must think that he had her stored in a drawer. Although he was later cleared of any involvement in the case, he went away to spend the festive period with his family in the Netherlands. But upon his arrest, his flat was actually sealed off and police actually cancelled the release of the reenactment of the night of Joanna's disappearance to be aired on Crime Watch, which I guess was a sign that they felt like they were really closing in on the perpetrator. DNA tests were carried out by a private forensic analysis company who were analysing some DNA that was found on Joanna's chest and they found that this DNA was a match for Vincent Tabak and that they could say that the probability of it not being a match for Vincent was less than one in a billion. Although they could not determine whether this DNA came from saliva, semen or even touch. So Vincent remained in custody for questioning and on the 22nd of January 2011, Vincent Tabak was charged with the murder of Joanna Yates and upon his arrest he was actually placed under suicide watch as well as being moved to a different prison due to concerns for his safety. So initially Vincent maintained that fact that he had nothing to do with Joanna's murder and that he was being framed by a corrupt official that had planted the DNA on Joanna's body. Although on February 8th, he actually admitted to a prison chaplain that he had murdered Joanna and that he planned to plead guilty. And so on May 5th, 2011, Vincent Tabak pleaded guilty to manslaughter, although rejected that he was guilty of murder. Although this plea was thrown out by the Crown Prosecution and they pursued with a trial. So prosecutors began building their case against Vincent Tabak and they actually found that in the days following Joanna's disappearance and the days following Christopher Jeffrey's arrest and appearance in the media, Vincent had actually been someone who was pushing the blame onto Christopher Jeffries. He had actually seen a television news article with Christopher Jeffries and showing him as a suspect. And he had then called investigators and said that Christopher was actually borrowing his car that evening. So British investigators sent out a detective to the Netherlands to conduct an interview with Vincent. Although when they arrived and they started asking him questions, they realised that he was acting quite weird. He was asking a lot of questions about what forensic work they were doing and his story changed a couple of times and it wasn't really making sense what he was saying. And so they started to think that it might be a bit of a ploy to frame Christopher Jeffries. So as I said, this is the witness that police had when they were investigating Christopher Jeffries. It was actually Vincent Tabak. Additionally to this, police analysed Vincent's computer history and his computer system and they found that in the months leading up to Joanna's murder, Vincent had actually contacted a number of sex workers in the UK and the US by phone, as well as watching violent pornography depicting women being controlled, bound, gagged and choked by men. They also found images of a woman with a striking resemblance to Joanna Yates and she was wearing a pink top and in one image she lifted the pink top to reveal her breasts and her bra and Joanna's body was actually found in a similar way to this wearing a similar pink top. So the trial against Vincent Tabak began on October 4th, 2011, where he again pleaded guilty to manslaughter but denied murder. And the prosecution presented their case that Vincent Tabak had strangled Joanna Yates at her home only minutes after she had arrived home from her pub outing on December 17th, 2010. It is believed that Vincent could have been spying on Joanna and noticed that Greg was not there and taken an opportunity to knock on her door rather than being invited in. So Vincent is around a foot taller than Joanna and it's believed that he used his height and his build to overpower her and pin her to the floor by her wrists. It was also noted that Joanna suffered 43 separate injuries including to her head, neck, and torso and it's believed that these injuries were acquired during the struggle and they included cuts, bruises and a fractured nose. The prosecution stated that the struggle would have been lengthy and that Joanna's death would have been slow and painful. They also presented evidence that suggests that Vincent tried to conceal his crime after the murder through disposing of her body and this included fibres that were found on her clothing that matched Vincent's car as well as his attempts to implicate Joanna's landlord Christopher Jeffries in the day's 
following her murder. Prosecution also stated that there would have been at least an hour delay before he left the apartment to dispose of Joanna's body and I think that this also nods to the possible sexual nature of the crime and of course when you look at the violent pornography that he had been viewing I guess that prosecutors believed that Vincent might have taken Joanna's body to his own apartment and this was the unexplained hour before he actually put her body in the boot of his car and drove away. After Vincent bundled Joanna into the boot of his car he actually drove to a local supermarket where he picked up some crisps and a beer and he also texted his girlfriend that he was bored. As well as this following the killing he googled the difference between murder and manslaughter as well as the definition of sexual assault. Again, this also nods to the possible sexual nature of the crime, although Vincent does deny this. So in his defence, Vincent claims that the killing was not at all sexually motivated and that he had killed her after he had tried to kiss her and she had screamed and so he tried to silence her by putting his hand over her mouth and the other hand around her neck for around 20 seconds after which she slumped to the floor and died. He had stated that Joanna had made a flirty comment and invited him in for a drink but then of course rejected his advances leading to this murder but of course this goes against the violent nature of her killing and the struggle that had ensued although Vincent claims he does not know how she obtained those 43 injuries as well as the fact that his memory from that night is hazy he stated that he held her with minimal force and that he was just in a state of panic after he'd realized what he'd done which led to him then disposing of her body and so the jury began deliberation on October 26th and returned with a guilty verdict two days later with a majority of 10 to 2 believing that Vincent was guilty of murder and Vincent was jailed for life with a minimum of 20 years. So that is everything that I have on this case. I think that it's so sad and I felt that especially when I heard that when she was out with her friends on that Friday night she told them that she was nervous to be in the apartment alone for the first weekend. That to me is so sad that she felt already like she was nervous and most people would probably tell themselves that they're just being silly but actually she ended up being murdered which is just heartbreaking. I do believe that Vincent murdered her and that the whole manslaughter ploy is not really that feasible when you think of the force that was proven to have been needed against Joanna. Also she was in such a happy relationship with Greg and planning for Christmas she had no reason to make advances against this stranger neighbour that she had never really met or spoken to before. In in terms of Joanna's landlord, he is now living a private life and as I said he was paid an undisclosed amount of money although this is thought to be quite a high amount in the six figure region which I think is fair enough because as I have shown you guys he was really vilified by the British media purely just because he looked like someone who they thought could commit a crime. One newspaper actually stated that it was impossible for someone to look this strange and not be guilty, which I think is just so naive. And as I said, it's lucky that now he's living his normal life, but this could have completely destroyed everything for him and that is terrifying but I hope you guys enjoyed this case and as always please leave any thoughts down below that you have on the case as well as any case suggestions that you'd like me to cover. Thank you for watching today's video as always leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed and I will see you in the next video.